Okay, last time we talked about dynamic programming and we're going to continue talking about dynamic programming for a long time. But I'm going to focus on a particular problem for today at least, and that's the problem of shortest paths. So we've already seen several different algorithms. So let me just formally write this. So this is the shortest path problem. And basically the input is a graph. We're going to consider a directed graph. So I have a directed graph G. And the goal is to find distances. The, the goal is to find shortest paths. But in the version that we've seen until now, in the input, I also give you some vertex, some vertex U in G. And the output should be the distance from U to every vertex V. So for every V in the set of vertices, actually, it's better if I write this one as more set of vertices too, you should print the distance, distance of U to V. Of course, I can also ask you for a path itself as well. And we've seen that the algorithms we have until this point not only create the distances, but they also create a shortest path tree. And then all of the paths in that tree are shortest paths, and you can use that to write the path itself. But this is actually what we call a single source shortest path problem. And this is because, of course, I'm fixing the source. In the input, I'm giving you the graph, and I'm also giving you the source vertex. And then for every target vertex V, I'm asking what is the distance from the fixed source vertex U to this target vertex V. So that's why it's called single source. Now let's see the algorithms that we have for this. So we've already talked of at least three different algorithms. So single source shortest path. So we've seen Dijkstra's algorithm, right? Let's say this is my algorithm. And then I want to write the runtime here. And then I want to say what limitations the algorithm has. So we've seen Dijkstra's algorithm. What was the runtime of Dijkstra? It depended on our implementation, right? So I'm going to say that my input has n vertices and m edges. So we saw that, uh, and I'm going to also assume that the number of edges is more than the number of vertices. So uh, we saw that if we use a heap, the runtime here would be O of M log N. And we saw that if we don't use a heap, then the runtime would just be N squared, right? And we talked that, well, it depends on how dense your graph is when you want to decide which one of these two implementations is going to work better. So if you have very few edges, then M log N is better. If the number of edges is almost N squared, then this one is better. Right, But what was the main limitation that we had in Dijkstra? The main limitation was that all of the weights of the edges had to be non-negative, right? So non-negative weights. Actually, I just realized I have forgotten to write this in the input. So in the input, of course, I have the source vertex but uh, my graph is also weighted. So I also have a weight for each one of my edges. So let's say I have a cost function in the input as well that takes each edge and gives me a cost or a weight, which is a real. Okay. Now, why did we need the non-negative weights assumption? Because that's what our greedy algorithm relied on. Remember every time that I wanted to say, I'm fixing the distance to a particular vertex, 
my argument was that it's impossible that I can go somewhere else and find a different path to this vertex that costs less. Because every path has to have uh, a non-negative total cost because every edge has a non-negative weight, right? So this is what we had for Dijkstra. And then in the last session, we saw the algorithm of Bellman Ford. So this is what Bellman and Ford designed. And remember the idea here was that we do a dynamic programming. The idea was I find the distance from U to every vertex V, assuming that I can take at most K steps, assuming that I can take uh, at most K edges, right? And then uh, this would give us actually a runtime of O and M. Okay. So this was the dynamic programming from the last session. And the limitation here was that, well, we could have negative weights on the edges, but we couldn't have negative cycles, right? So we were saying no negative cycles. Please close the door when you come in. Okay. So why did we need this assumption that there are no negative cycles? Because if you have a negative cycle, then shortest path just doesn't make sense because you can just go to the cycle and keep looping around the cycle, right? Okay. But additionally, we saw that if we do have a negative cycle, the Bellman-Ford algorithm can actually detect it. So we would just run this Bellman-Ford algorithm for one extra iteration. And if the distance has changed, we said that we're sure we have a negative cycle. Yes. And finally, we also had another simple dynamic programming algorithm that we saw in the previous session, which worked in linear time, n plus m. But this worked when you had no cycles at all. So this was when you had a DAC. Okay. And the idea here was that you just do a topological sort and then you define a dynamic programming that goes from left to right on your vertices. Now, in this session, we want to look into a different type of shortest path. I want to do an all pair shortest path. So I want to say, I give you a graph, and that's all the input that I'm giving you. I'm not going to give you a source vertex. And then for every pair of vertices, you should tell me what is the distance from this vertex to that vertex, OK? So this is our focus in this session. It's all pairs shortest path. And again, my input is exactly as before. By the way, in all of these cases, I'm working with directed graphs, but all of these algorithms work for undirected graphs as well. Sometimes you don't even need to change the algorithm, for example, uh, in the case of Dijkstra, it just works for undirected graphs too. Sometimes you might have to say that, well, uh, if I have an undirected edge between U and V, I look at it as two different edges, an edge from U to V and a different edge from V to U. And then that makes your graph directed and you can just use the same algorithms. Anyway, when we're doing all per shortest path, my input is going to be a directed graph. Again, G, V, E. I'm assuming, as usual, that it has N vertices and M edges. I'm assuming that there is a cost associated to every edge. Please close the door. And I'm not giving you a source vertex. So the output will just contain this. You should say for every pair of vertices, for every U and V that are in the set V, you should print the distance from vertex U to vertex V. OK. Nice. So how can I solve this? Well, the first solution that comes to mind is to just use the previous algorithms, right? For a fixed starting point, for a fixed source, 
I have these three algorithms. Let's forget about the simple DP. I have Dijkstra and Bellman board. I can just run them with every possible starting point. So I can just run Dijkstra n times, or I can run Bellman Ford n times, mm -hmm. right? And I will get an algorithm for all pairs shortest path. So let me just copy this. So if I run Dijkstra n times, so basically I say for every possible source vertex U, I run a Dijkstra, I find the distance from U to every other vertex. Then my runtime will just be multiplied by an N, right? So this would be NM log N, this would be N cube. And of course I have the same limitation as before. I should have non-negative weights because otherwise my Dijkstra doesn't work. Okay, similarly, I can do n Bellman Ford algorithms for every possible starting vertex. And then my runtime would be n squared times m. And I will again have the same limitation as before. So in this case, I can have negative weights, but I cannot have negative cycles. OK. Now, if you look at it, this one is kind of good. It's n cube. But this one is pretty bad in comparison. Because in the worst case, if I have a ton of edges in my graph, it's possible that the number of edges is almost the number of uh, vertices squared. So m is almost n squared. And this is kind of like n to the power of 4. right? And I don't like that. So this whole session is about reducing that. OK. Now, here's the first idea. Let's say uh, that I want to look at what the Bellman-Ford algorithm does. But instead of running the Bellman-Ford algorithm on one vertex at a time, I want to, let's say, run it on all possible starting vertices in parallel. So, and I will show you what I mean by that. So in Bellman-Ford, we constantly had this idea that, let's say I want to find the distance from u to v. Actually, let me just use this. This uvk was supposed to be the shortest path from u to v, the weight of the shortest path from u to v, with at most k edges, or at most k steps. OK. Now, how did I find this? The idea was very simple. I said I have my vertex u. I have my vertex v. I want to reach v after at most k steps. So I just do a casework on the last step, on the last edge that I'm taking to come to v. So I look at all the edges that are coming into V. I might have many edges coming into V. And they might come from a bunch of other vertices. So let's call them W1, W2, W3, so on. I say, if I want to reach V in at most case steps, I have to first reach one of these W vertices in at most K minus one steps, and then take the edge from them to V. Right, So this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to go from u to, let's say, w1 in at most k minus 1 steps. OK? So we basically said that the distance from u to v in k steps is going to be the minimum over every w that has an edge to v of the distance from u to w in k minus one steps plus the cost of the edge from w to v. Now, what I want you to see here is that this formula looks kind of like matrix multiplication, right? Now, this might not be 
uh, very obvious to you. So I'm going to first give you a different problem and we're going to solve that problem using the same idea. And then you will see why this is matrix multiplication. Okay, here's the side quest. So let's say I give you some graph. So my input is again a graph G graph. Okay, but let's say I don't have weights. And I also give you two particular vertices, U and V. Okay, so I give you U and V in the set of vertices. And I also give you a number K. And the question that you should answer in the output is this. What is the number of paths from U to V that have lengths exactly equal to K? edge more than once, that's fine. So I want you to answer what is the number of different paths from U to V with exactly K edges. Now, the first case is quite trivial. What happens if k is one? If k is one, I'm just asking you how many edges are there between u and v, right? So if k is one, I just wanna know, is there an edge between u and v? And I mean, if in my graph, I allow multiple edges between the same pairs of vertices, then I'm asking how many edges are there between u and v? But until this point in the course, we were used to saving our graphs as adjacency lists. I can also save my graph as an adjacency matrix, right? So what is my adjacency matrix? My adjacency matrix is basically going to be a matrix A, which is N by N. And the idea is that, uh, the entry at index ij is one, if and only if there is an edge from i to j, okay? Or again, if you can have multiple edges, then the entry at index ij of this matrix is just going to be the number of edges that you have from vertex i to vertex j, okay? So remember my problem is this, I have, vertices u and v, I'm also given some k. The question is how many paths of lengths and k do I have? And we said that if k is one, then the number of paths is just the number of edges between u and v. So I can just return uh, a of u v. Okay. But now I want you to consider what happens if I multiply the matrix A by itself. So let's say I look at the ma matrix A squared. So A squared is going to be, I have this matrix A, which was N by N times itself. Okay. Now, what am I going to put at entry uh, let's say ij of a squared. Remember matrix multiplication, I'm basically taking one row and multiplying it by one column, right? So the entry at index ij of a squared is going to be the sum, ah, I've already used k here, so I cannot use k, sorry. So the sum of, let's say, l from one to n of, a i l times a l j, right? That's just the definition of matrix multiplication. But here's the thing. 
remember from before what these values were. AIL is the number of ways to go from vertex I to vertex L in one step. ALJ is the number of ways to go from vertex L to vertex J in one step. So if I want to find the number of ways to go from I to J in two steps, I can say I, I have I here, I have J here. With one step, I have to go somewhere else. I have to go to some L. And then from that L, I have to go to J. So again, with one step. So I can just do a case work over L. I can say my internal vertex L is either vertex one or two or N, so on. So I'm going to sum over all of them. And then what is the number of ways to go from I to L in one step? It's AIL. What is the number of ways to go from L to J in one step? That's ALJ. So apparently, if I look at the matrix A squared at position IJ, this is the number of paths of lengths. Uh, okay, let, let me not use lengths. Let's say the number of paths with two edges. from I to J, right? Now, of course, I can apply the same argument for any lengths, right? So if I look at the matrix AK at index IJ, what is this? This is, again, the sum of L from one to, of the matrix AK minus one, I L times A L J. So this is the same case work as before. I claim that this is the number of paths with exactly K edges from I to J. Why is that? Well, I can just prove it by induction. Let's say that this is the number of paths with K minus one edges from I to L. If I want to count the number of paths with K edges from I to J, Again, I do the same casework as before. I say there is going to be uh, one vertex that I'm going to see right before J. What is that vertex that I'm seeing right before J? It's either one or two, so on or N. Let's call it L, right? So I have to go from I to L in K minus one steps, but this is the number of ways that I can do that. And then I have to go from L to J in one step, but this is the number of ways I can do that, right? So this proves that if I look at the matrix A to the power of K and I look at uh, the entry IJ, that's the number of paths with exactly K edges from I to J, okay? Number of paths with K edges from I to J. Okay. So now I can actually answer my side quest, right? So I say, take this matrix, raise it to the power of K. That not only gives me the number of paths of length K from U to V, it actually gives me the number of such paths between any pair of vertices. So instead of having U and V in my input, I could just say that in my output, I output for every U and V, what is the number of different paths from U to V with exactly K edges? And again, this is just calculating A to the power of K. My solution here is to just find a to the power of k. Now, how do I find a to the power of k? Well, I can, I know how to do matrix multiplication, right? But I wouldn't just multiply it by itself k times. That's a little bit stupid. Instead, I would uh, do the logarithmic algorithm that we've seen for computing powers before. So if I want to compute a to the power of k, I would compute a to the power of k over two and multiply it by itself. Right, so that way, my total runtime would be n cube log k, 
because this is the number of multiplications that I have to do. And multiplying two n by n matrices, I can do that in n. Technically, you can do this even faster. We've seen Strassen's algorithm. So instead of n cube log k, you could also get like n to the power of, what was it? Log of seven base two times log k. So you can do this too. Okay. But all of this was a side quest. It was just counting the number of different paths. Let's go back to our main problem. My main problem wasn't to find the number of paths with k steps from u to v, but I wanted to find the weight of the shortest path, not the shortest path itself. Let's say just the weight, the total cost of the shortest path from u to v that has at most cases. Now I have two problems here. My first problem is that of course I don't want the number, I want the weight. My second problem is that I have at most K instead of just exactly K. In the previous case, I was just summing up and counting the number of paths, but here I want to find the shortest one. So here's the idea. And for those of you who have passed algebra or even linear algebra before, this would be very easy. I'm going to do the matrix multiplication in a different ring. So I'm basically going to change the definition of addition and multiplication, right? So I'm going to do matrix multiplication. Now, what is normal matrix multiplication? Normal matrix multiplication says that if you multiply A by B and you get C, then in C, the element at position IJ is just the sum over all possible K of AIK times BKJ, right? Now, I have two different operations in this definition. One is this this multiplication, and the other one is this, the summation, okay? Let's say I change these operators. So for example, whenever I'm doing multiplication, instead of multiplication, I do some other operation. And the same thing for adding. Remember, I want to, at the end of the day, get the, shortest path, right? So if I want to get the shortest path, it makes sense that instead of summation, I actually take the minimum. And instead of multiplication, I'm just going to do addition. So this is what I'm doing. Instead of summing up, I say take the min. And instead of multiply, I say add, okay? So I'm defining a new type of matrix multiplication where playing A by B and I get the matrix C. The entry at Cij is actually, well, instead of summing, I'm doing minimum. So the minimum for K from one to N of Aik plus Bkj, okay? I'm just defining a new way of multiplying matrices. That's all I'm doing here. Now I claim that with this new way of multiplying matrices, I'm actually going to get shortest paths. Okay. So remember my matrix A is basically my adjacency matrix. So in this case, because I'm now working with, uh, a directed graph that has weights on the edges, I'm going to put these weights into the adjacency matrix, okay? So I'm going to start like this. I'm going to say, what is the initial value in my matrix, A, I, J? Well, if I and J are the same, it's going to be zero, okay? Zero if I is equal to J. If there is an edge, from i to j, actually, I don't even need the zero here, but okay, yeah, whatever. If there is an edge from i to j, I'm just going to put its weight, 
So C of ij, if ij is an edge. And otherwise I'm going to put infinity, okay? So this is my initial adjacency matrix. Now, what does this give me? Actually, I, I don't need even this zero. I can just do this. I can do these two cases. It's simpler. So uh, my Aij is just the cost of the edge from i to j, if that edge exists. And otherwise, it's infinity. OK. Now, what is this Aij going to give me? So it's basically the shortest path from i to j that takes exactly one edge. That's how I'm going to think of my adjacency matrix, right? So Aij is equal to the cost of the shortest path from i to j with exactly one edge. Okay. Now, what happens if I look at A squared? But remember, I'm doing my matrix multiplication like this. Okay. So what is A squared of IJ? It's just the sum for every K from one to N of AIK times AKJ. But remember, I said I don't do sum, I do minimum instead. So this is the minimum k from 1 to n. And I said I don't do a, a multiplication, I do addition instead. OK. Here's the thing. What was aik? It was the shortest class from i to k with one edge. akj is the shortest path from k to j with one edge. And I'm trying every possible k, and I'm taking the minimum. So this is giving me the shortest path from i to j with exactly two edges. OK. So again, if I wanted to solve this without the matrix multiplication, I want to go from i to j with two edges. But I want to take the shortest path. I want to have the smallest total cost. Right? So I say I have to go somewhere in between. Let's call that somewhere k. I have to go from i to k with one edge. And well, the shortest way to go there with one edge is a i k. And then I have to go from k to j with one edge. And the shortest way to do that is a k j. So my total cost is just a i k plus a k j. Right? And of course, I'm going to take the minimum overall k because I want to find the shortest path overall. So this is the a j is exactly equal to the cost of the shortest path with exactly k edges. Sorry, with exactly two edges from i to j. Now, I'm pretty sick and tired of drawing this again. So you know what's happening now. We're just going to do induction. And so generally, if I take a to the power of k and I look at entry ij, that's going to be the cost of the shortest path with exactly k edges from i to j. Cost of the shortest path. from i to j with exactly k edges. Now, again, as before, I have a problem with this exactly, right? I don't want to find the shortest path that uses exactly k edges. I want to find the shortest path that uses at most k edges. OK, so the idea here is very simple. And it's actually also very elegant. So I have a graph G. And basically, I want to find the shortest path from I to J 
that uses at most k edges. So let's say I have vertex i here and I have vertex j and I have a path. And let's say the cost of this path is alpha. And let's say that it uses at most k edges. Okay. I want to create another graph. Let's call this one g prime, such that whenever I have a path like this, I have a path from i to j in g prime with the exact same cost, but with exactly k edges. Okay. So because I can find this value for any graph. So I can find the shortest path from i to j that has exactly k edges. But of course, I wanted the shortest path that has at most k edges. So if I can somehow go from this graph g to g prime, then I can apply my algorithm on g prime. And the idea is very simple. Let's say this is my graph g. So I have my original graph g. In order to go to g prime, I'm just going to add some self loops. So I'm going to say I go over every one of my vertices and I add an edge from this vertex to itself with weight zero. Okay, so I do this for every vertex. Okay, now my self loops have a weight of zero. So they don't contribute anything to the cost of a path. But if in the original graph, I had a path of let's say length at most five. So maybe I have this path of length two that is going from this vertex to this vertex. Now I can just take some of these self loops on the way and I can make it into a path of lengths exactly five. So I start here, I go here. So I'll go one, two, three, and then I'll go up. That's a path of lengths exactly five, of uh, exactly five edges. So now when I add these edges, I know that in G prime, I have a path from I to J with a particular cost with exactly K edges. If and only if in G, I had a path from I to J with at most K edges and the same cost. Okay, so now let my matrix B be the adjacency matrix of G prime. Okay. All I have to do is to output Bn because I can take the adjacency matrix I can raise it to the power of n. It gives me the cost of the shortest path from i to j in g prime with exactly n edges. But that's the cost of the shortest path from i to j in g with at most k edges, which is exactly what I was looking for. So I just output bn. And in order to find bn, I'm going to use fast exponentiation. So in order to find b to the power of n, I find b to the power of n over 2 and multiply it by itself. But remember, my multiplication is this new definition of multiplication that we had here. So I'm using min and plus instead of uh, sum and multiplication. And finally, uh, this is going to take n cube log n. So the log n is because of fast exponentiation, but I cannot use Strassen here because Strassen only works when you have uh, the normal addition and multiplication. But here I have min and plus. So I don't have a variant of Strassen here. Uh, the way I'm multiplying my matrices is just using this definition. So for every element, I'm going to calculate this minimum and so on. So now every matrix multiplication, every matrix multiplication uh, is taking O n cube. And I don't know of a way of doing this faster because Strassen depended on the definition of addition and multiplication. And we changed that. So I don't have a faster way of multiplying matrices here. The only way I have to multiply my matrices is to just definition. And this definition is going to take O n cube time. But I do it O log n times. So my total runtime is going to be O n cube log n. OK. So we can now take this table and kind of extend it, right? So this is where we are. Oops.
I have this new algorithm, which is just, I don't know, let's call it matrix exponentiation. And it's taking n cube log n. Now, what are the limitations? Can I have negative weights? Yes, you can just go over the algorithm and you can see that everything goes through. None of my proofs really depend on the weights being positive. But I cannot have negative cycles. Now, why can I not have negative cycles? Because again, negative cycles are always going to create problems. You will not even have a shortest path if you have negative cycles. Now, as you see here, this is better than doing Bellman Ford n times, hopefully, right? I mean, it depends again on your value of m. Uh, but assuming that m is large, assuming that you have many edges, this would be faster. This is n cube log n. This is n to the power of four, right? But it's still not as fast as doing n dijkstra's. So the question is, can I just do n dijkstra's even if I have negative weights? Well, of course, the answer is no, because we've seen Dijkstra doesn't work with negative weights. We've seen examples of Dijkstra working incorrectly. If you have done the extra reading that I gave you, you've seen that example. Now, uh, so this doesn't work. But if I could somehow take my graph and change it into a different graph so that all the edge weights are non-negative, then I could apply Dijkstra. And I actually prefer that, right? Because Dijkstra has a runtime of n cube, and that's faster than everything that I have until this point, even though it's just faster by factor of log n in comparison with this one, it's still faster. And also, uh, if I have very few edges, then Dijkstra is much faster. Whereas here in this matrix exponenti exponentiation thing, I'm not really using any assumption on the number of edges, right? My runtime doesn't even depend on the number of edges because anyway, I'm just using the adjacency matrix, multiplying it by itself. It's always an n by n matrix, okay? So here's our next algorithm. And this is actually Johnson's algorithm. The idea is quite simple. The idea is take G and turn it into some other graph somehow into G prime, such that all weights in G prime are non-negative. Okay. And then just apply N Dijkstra's on G prime. Okay, apply and Dijkstra's on G prime. Now, if I have a graph G prime that has all non-negative weights, of course, Dijkstra works on it. But the question is, how do I turn my graph into a different graph that only has non-negative weights, right? So what is the magic here? And also, if I turn a graph into another graph, and if this other graph has only non-negative weights, it's impossible that the distances in G prime are exactly the same as the distances in G. Because when I have negative weights, I can have negative distances. But when I have non-negative weights, all the distances will also be non-negative. So it's not like I can take the graph G and turn it into another graph while preserving the distances and also say that all of my edge weights are non-negative. I have to somehow then be able to convert the distances between G prime and G, okay? So this is the last step, convert the distances between G prime and G. The second part of magic, so this is magic too. We have to figure out how to do these two things. Okay. Here's what I want you to consider. Let's say that I have an edge from a vertex U to a vertex V. Okay. 
And let's say that I have a negative weight on this edge. So for example, I have a weight of minus five here. And then let's say I have another edge from V to W and this one also has a negative weight. I don't know, minus two. Here's the technique I want to use. I want to give a weight to each one of my vertices. Okay, so give a weight or some textbooks call it a potential, whatever you like. So give a weight uh, to every vertex or yeah, so I generally show the weight with H. So H of U is the weight of U. For some reason it's H. And then I want to change the weight that I assign to each one of the edges, okay? So remember each one of my edges had an original cost, which was cost of UV, right? So, and I have to now assign a new cost in the new graph to it. Let's call it C prime of UV. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, just take the weight of U minus the weight of V plus the original weight. Okay. Now, why am I doing this? Because I want these things to cancel out. So here's the thing. Let's say I give a weight to you. For example, I give a weight of uh, whatever. Now, let's just call it H of U. And I have given a weight to V, H of V. I have given a weight to W, H of W. Now, what is the total weight of this path in the new graph? <laughs> so for the edge UV, I'm going to have the original weight that it had, minus 5, plus H of U minus h of v. Now for the next edge, I'm going to have the original weight plus h of v minus h of w. But here's the thing, this one and this one cancel out. Right. So generally, if I have a path, even with more than two edges, all the weights of the vertices in between will cancel out and only the weight of the first vertex and the weight of the last vertex will remain there. So if I somehow create a new graph with this system of weighting, I can always find the shortest path in my new graph and I can convert it to the shortest path in the original graph. Okay, just subtract H of U, add H of W. That's the idea, but of course, the other thing that I want to do is to choose these values, h of u, h of v, h of w, and so on. Basically, choose a weight for every vertex, such that I make sure this new cost that I'm applying to every edge is not negative. Because remember, that's the whole point. I want to uh, apply Dijkstra in the end. OK. Now, here's where Johnson's great idea comes in. Here's what Johnson does. Johnson says, let's create a new vertex. And let's just connect that vertex to every other vertex. Okay, so I'm creating a new vertex and I'm calling it J for Johnson. And I'm just adding an edge from J to every other vertex. And all of these edges are going to have a weight of zero. Okay, so this is Johnson's algorithm. Step one, add a new edge, oh, sorry, add a new vertex J. And the edges from J to every vertex V. And this is an edge with weight zero. Okay. Now next, I'm going to find the shortest path from J to every one of my other vertices. Okay. Now, the shortest path is not necessarily zero because for example, here, if you look at vertex V, I can go from J to A and then from A to B and that's actually minus two, right? The shortest path is not necessarily zero. So my second step is to 
compute for every vertex V the distance from this new vertex that I just added to V. Okay. How can I compute this? Which one of the algorithms that we have seen until this point can be applied here? I can just apply Bellman Fort, right? Because remember, uh, I have to go up even more. For single source shortest path, this is single source. I'm only starting from vertex J. And for single source shortest path, Bellman Ford only needed the assumption that you don't have negative cycles. So you can have negative weights, and I do have negative weights, but I'm just going to apply Bellman Ford. So this step of Johnson is just Bellman Ford. So I'm going to call Bellman Ford here and calculate the distance from every vertex J, from vertex J to every vertex V. Here's the part where things get interesting. I'm going to call this the weight of vertex V. So I define H of V to be the distance from this new random vertex that I added to V. Now, what do I do next? Next, I just go over every one of my edges and I create my new graph, right? So create a new graph. I mean, it's the same graph, except that the weights are different, G prime, uh, where the cost for going from U to V in this G prime, so C prime, is just the H of U that I found in the previous case, minus H of V, plus uh, whatever the cost was in the original graph. Okay. Now, this is the idea that we had here. So we said that if I assign a cost to every vertex, no matter how I assign it, uh, when I take a pass, all the costs of the internal vertices cancel out. Okay. So if I can find the shortest path in this new graph, I can also find the shortest path in the old graph. But very importantly, I claim that in this new graph, all of the weights are non-negative. OK. So this is my claim. For every edge, uv that is in my set of edges, we have C prime of uv. So the new cost that I'm assigning to the edge uv is greater than or equal to 0. Let's prove this. OK. Here's the thing. The vertices. Look at the vertex u and the vertex v. What was the cost that I assigned to u? It was the path, the shortest path, from this new dummy vertex j to u. And the cost of v was also the shortest path from this new vertex to v. OK. So I had this vertex J, and I took the shortest path to U. I called that the cost to U. And then I took the shortest path to V, and I called that the cost to V. Okay. Now, I also know that I have an edge from U to V. I know that there is an edge here that goes from U to V, and it had some cost in my original graph cost of u. Okay. Now, remember, I had my original graph, and I just added this vertex j, and I added edges from j to everywhere else. So here's my question. What can I say about the distance from vertex j to vertex v, or the shortest path from j to v? Well, one way to reach v is to go from j to u first, and then from u to v. Maybe that's the shortest path, maybe it's not. 
But in any case, the shortest pass is going to cost less than or equal to this particular pass that goes from J to U and then takes the edge from U to V. So the distance from J to V is less than or equal to the distance from J to U plus the cost of the edge from U to V, right? Because this is just the cost of some pass from J to V. And of course, the distance from J to V is less than or equal to the cost of any pass from J to V. Okay, now let's just write it. The distance from J to V, this was the cost that I assigned to the vertex V. The distance from J to U was the cost that I assigned to the vertex U. And this is of course C of UV. Take this H of V to the other side, you get that zero is less than or equal to, oops, sorry, this was H, is less than or equal to H of U minus H of V plus C of U. And by the way, this is exactly what I assigned as my new cost to the edge UV. So the new cost that I'm assigning to every edge is not negative, right? And again, remember if I had a pass, if I have a pass that starts here, let's say this is U0, then it goes to U1, then it goes to U2, so on, until it reaches some vertex V. In the original graph, the cost was like C of U0, U1, plus C of U1, U2, so on, to C of this last one, right? In the new graph, for every edge, I'm reducing the cost by the cost of its endpoints, but I'm also increasing it by the cost of its starting point. So in the new graph, I have done, I have the exact same cost as before, but plus the cost of U0 minus the cost of U1 plus the cost of U1 minus the cost of U2 plus the cost of U2 and so on. And again, all of these internal costs cancel out. So the only things that don't cancel out is this cost of U at the beginning, and then I have minus cost of V at the end. So this means that the distance from the vertex U to the vertex V in my original graph G is just the same as the distance from U to V in this new graph G prime minus the weight that I assigned to U plus the weight that I assigned to V. So if I can find all the distances in G prime, and I know all of these weights, of course, I can just compute each of the distances in G in constant time. Okay. But now, remember, this lemma says that all of the edges in G prime have non-negative weight. So in G prime, I can just use Dijkstra. And if I want to find the shortest path from every vertex to every other vertex, I can just use N Dijkstra's. So this is the first step of Johnson's algorithm. Use N Dijkstra's. in G prime. And finally, you just output the answer. Every U and V, you just output this thing. Let's call this star because I'm too lazy. Output this star, okay, which is the distance. Now, what is our runtime here? Well, first of all, this is very interesting. We're using both Bellman Ford and Dijkstra inside our algorithm. So this is probably the first algorithm in this course that is using two of the previous algorithms that were kind of for the same problem. But let's just see how much time we're spending on each step. So in the first step, I'm adding a new vertex and I'm adding an edge from this new vertex to every other vertex. That's one vertex and n new edges. So this is O n. 
In the second vertex, uh, sorry, in the second step, I'm doing just one Bellman Ford. I'm doing Bellman Ford only starting from this new dummy vertex J, right? What was the runtime for one Bellman Ford? It was NM. And this gives me the weights that I'm assigning to every vertex. Now I'm creating this new graph. All I'm doing here is going over every edge and changing uh, its cost. So this is just OM for every edge. I'm just calculating this new cost. And then finally, I'm doing N Dijkstra's. Okay. So doing N Dijkstra's, it either takes N cube or an M log N. You get a choice on which one you want to use, N M log N. More. And finally, for every pair, I have to again calculate something, but the thing that I'm calculating can be calculated in constant time. So this one is O N squared. So basically, if you look at all of these steps, of course, I'm doing Bellman Fort here and Dijkstra here, but everything else that I'm doing is much cheaper. So the total time that I'm spending is just the sum of the time for Bellman and the sum of, and the time for Dijkstra. Okay. So that's all I'm getting. So my total runtime is nm for Bellman plus either n cube or nm log n. But in any case, both n cube and nm log n are bigger than nm, right? Uh, because m is at most n squared. So my runtime is basically the runtime of index. So I have Johnson's algorithm and my runtime is the same as N Dijkstra's. So it's either O N M log N or O N cube. And now I don't need to have non-negative weights. The only thing here is that I should not have any negative cycles. So no negative cycles and so this is amazing. Basically, we got the same runtime as N Dijkstra's without having to have the limitation that Dijkstra gave us. And the way we avoided this limitation was by doing one Bellman port. I'm going to give you one more algorithm. We have 10 minutes, right? So let's do this. So we talked about Bellman port, and we saw that Bellman port was basically a dynamic program. And the idea in the dynamic programming is that you should always define some subproblems, and you have to find a topological sorting order between the subproblems. Now, the way we did this in Bellman Ford was that we limited the number of steps that we could take in every subproblem. So instead of asking what is the distance from U to V, I asked what is the distance from U to V if I can take at most K steps. So here's a different dynamic programming approach. I want to again define subproblems, and I want to have something like this. So I have D of i, j, k, and this is again going to be the distance or the shortest path from i to j. But now, instead of saying that k is the number of steps, I say that k limits the vertices that can be seen on the path from i to j. Okay, so this is going to be the cost of the shortest path from I to J that only uses the first K vertices, only uses the vertices one, two to K as internal vertices. Okay, so the idea is very simple. I want to go from vertex i to vertex j. I have a bunch of paths, right? I say that all of the nodes that appear in between, all of these nodes should have numbers between one to k. So I'm basically assuming that in my graph, I only have the vertices from one to k, but I also have vertex i and j if they're outside. I can only use the vertices from one to k as the stopping points in my path that is going from i to j. And among all the paths that have this property, I want to find the shortest one. Now, of course, if I set k to n, 
then I have no limitation on the vertices that I can see on my way. So that would just give me the shortest path. Okay. Now, what can I do? Here's the thing. I want to use one of the lemmas that we used in the previous session. And it's that in this path from I to J, I'm going to see every vertex at most once. Because if there is a vertex that I see twice, so let's say I started from I, I wanted to go to J, as I was going, I saw some vertex twice. That means there was a cycle, right? And we're assuming that we don't have any negative cycles. So I can just remove that cycle and I will have a shorter path because the weight of that cycle is not negative. Maybe the weight of the cycle is zero and then I will just have the same length overall. But anyway, I don't need cycles. So I can always assume that my shortest path sees each of these vertices at most points. Okay. So let's see if I can find some sort of a recurrence relation for these values, D of i, j, k. So I want to go from i to j, and I can see any of the first k vertices on the way there. So D of i, j, k is equal to, now I'm just going to do a case work. I say, do I see this last vertex k somewhere on my path? I either do or don't, right? So this is my idea. I either see k somewhere in my path, somewhere in the path from i to j, or I don't, right? If I know that I don't see vertex k, then that's just dp of i, j, k minus 1. Right, because I can only see vertices one to k minus one in my path from i to j. Okay. Now suppose that I know that somewhere in my path from i to j, I'm seeing vertex k. So I'm starting from i, I'm taking some path, reaching vertex k, and then continuing, and at some point reaching vertex j. Now. If this is the shortest path from i to j, then the path that I took from i to k should also be the shortest path from i to k, right? And the path that I took from k to j, that should also be optimal. It should also be the shortest path from k to j, right? But we said that every vertex appears at most once. So in here, I only have the vertices from 1 to k minus 1 as intermediate vertices between i and k. Right, And here, again, as intermediate k and j, I can only have the vertices 1 to k minus 1. So what I have is this. I go from i to k, and I take the shortest possible path, but I know that my internal vertices can only be from 1 to k minus 1. And then from there, from k, I go to j, and I take the shortest possible path, but I can only have the first k minus one vertices. So this is going to be my shortest path if I visit in k. But this one was the shortest path if I knew that I didn't visit k. I want the shortest path overall, so I just take the minimum of these two. Right? And that gives me the length of the shortest path from i to j that uses only the vertices index from 1 to k as internal vertices. It doesn't have to use all of them. It uses a subset of them. OK? Nice. And well, I sometimes write d, sometimes write dp. Let's just go with dp everywhere, because it's dynamic programming. But I can also go with d, because it's distance. OK, so now I have a very simple algorithm. And my simple algorithm is just computing this dp. Look, I have to find a topological order for my subproblems. I have a subproblem for every combination of i, j, and k. But this subproblem only depends on other subproblems that have a smaller value of k. They have k minus 1 here. 
So if I just compute them in the order of smallest k to largest k, it will work out. So this is my implementation. I just say for every k from one to n, uh, for every i from one to n, and for every j from one to n, just do this. So dp of i, j, k becomes the minimum of these two things, of dp of i, j, k minus one, and dp of i, k, k minus one, plus dp of k, j, k minus one. That's the whole algorithm. Of course, you also need uh, a basis, and that's why I left some space here. So what is my base case? That means only the first vertex can be on the way. So that's not a good base case. Actually, let me start from k0. So I say, if k is 0, then this means nothing can be on the way from i to j, right? So I would just say dp of i, j, and 0. Well, if there is nothing in the way, I can only take a direct edge from i to j, right? So that's just whatever I have in my adjacency matrix B from before, right? And otherwise, if k is not 0, just use this. So again, four or five lines of code. What is my runtime? This is the simplest question in all of this class. I have three four loops that are going n iterations, all n iterations each. And they're nested. And inside them, I'm doing a constant amount of work. So this is just O n cube, right? Very important. The most common bug that I see in implementing this is that people forget the order and they do like i, j, and then k inside. That's wrong. You have to do k outside. Because again, the topological order of your uh, dynamic programming subproblems actually matters. OK? So this is just O n q. And this is actually called the floyd Warshall algorithm. So we can go back to our list here. So now we also have Floyd Warshall. And this is O n cube. And again, it works whenever you don't have negative silence. And you can go over everything. That, that's the condition. So no negative cycles. Now. You see here that this is kind of the same runtime as Johnson, and it's much easier to code, which is the reason why I taught you about Johnson first, because otherwise you wouldn't listen to Johnson after I did Floyd Warshall. But there are some cases where Johnson is faster, and that's when you have very few edges. If m is much smaller than n squared, then actually nm log n is a better runtime than nq. One last point before you go. Just like before, when in the Bellman-Ford algorithm, we saw that we can drop this last index in our TP, we can drop the K. It works if you do it here too. And I'm going to do like a coding session on this and then I'll prove it there that you can do it. So basically you can just have three, four loops and inside you don't have this uh, third index. You just say DP of IJ becomes the minimum of what it is and dp of ik plus dp of kj. Okay, see you tomorrow.